Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of The Chocolate Life Live. My name is Clay Gordon. I'm your host today. I'm also the creator and the moderator of thechocolatelife.com. And today, what we're going to be talking about is a, a new stage, a new, a new chapter in my life um, that's going to start off with something called the Craft Chocolate um, Odyssey, the Cross Country Craft Chocolate Odyssey. Now, you will notice that I'm a completely different background because I have, to some extent, started my trip, um, even though I am not headed west yet. Um, but a different background, you may hear dog barking, you may hear other things going on around me. So just wanted to let you know um, that, that, but you can see that I'm in a new place. Also, um, if you get a chance, go into the comments, um, go into the chat, wherever you are. Uh, let me know where in the world you are connecting from, because I love um, connecting with people, understand where they're going, where they're coming from, where they're checking in from. And then I can get um, a shout out to you on the screen if you do a shout out to me. And also, uh, if you have questions about anything that's going on during the course of the episode, then just put them into the comments wherever you are, and I can get the question asked and answered during the course of the hour. So with all that out of the way, let's go um, get started. So um, this is the um, chocolatelife.com um, right now. Here is the homepage. Um, and uh, people who are regulars here will know that for every single live stream that I create, I create a post on the Chocolate Life, and there are um, resources and background and all sorts of information about um, what it is that's going to happen during the course of the episode. Also, if there are any resources that get mentioned during the course of the episode, so links to web pages and things like that, I will put them on this post. If you are a member of the thechocolatelife.com and you are logged in, then you can go down to the bottom and you can add comments onto the page itself. But you do have to be a member and, you know, there is always a free membership. So um, with that. So let's get, let's get on the road, uh, so to speak. So uh, I've been living in the New York City metropolitan area for close to 40 years now. In June, it will be 40 years since I graduated from Rhode Island School of Design, packed a station wagon full of everything that I owned, a borrowed, borrowed car, from a friend and moved everything from Providence to Manhattan. And as I say, except for one year, when I was out in Los Angeles uh, working on a startup, I've been living in the New York City, City metropolitan area for 40 years. Now, what happened recently was a confluence of events. So three major changes happened in my life, which loosened all the anchors to my staying here in New York City. So um, I'm not going into detail about what those are, but in the process of thinking about it, um, I said, you know, perhaps there is now an opportunity to um, change things up. Um, I have sisters who live out west, one in Arizona and one in Oregon. Um, there is some work that I can do out west as well. And the nature of my work is I'm doing it virtually. I'm connecting here to you on the Chocolate Life um, um, here on uh, streaming to you. And so I said, I can, I can do this anywhere. Why do I have to be in New York City? And so I made a decision fairly spur of the moment um, to move out of New York City. I had to be out of my apartment on the 1st of April. I had to be moved out by tomorrow. Um, and uh, I decided if I'm going to be heading west, that what I might want to do is make it a road trip. So rather than flying to, um, rather than flying from New York to Phoenix, why not do it on the ground? The last time I had made a a cross-country road trip or nearly cross-country road trip was in the late 1970s, uh, I think. Um, I was living in Portland, Oregon. I had to go to Cincinnati, Ohio, and I took a bus from Portland through Salt Lake City, I think to Omaha, from Omaha to Chicago to Cincinnati. And <clears throat> a three or four day trip, and I decided I really wasn't up to it right now. So I said, why don't I make the trip by train which is the inspiration for today's image, train tracks. Um, although this image, I believe, is of the Canadian Rockies. It's in Alberta, not in California, but I'm, 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 or not in the United States. But I'm hoping that somewhere in my journey along the way uh, that I will get to see a, uh, a view like this along the road. Uh, so I said to myself, all right, so why don't I, why don't I make the trip cross country on the ground? And while I'm doing that, why don't I visit craft chocolate makers that I know and get a chance to eat some local food and just have an adventure along the way? And uh, so I am 
here in northeastern Massachusetts. I'm near the New Hampshire border, about an hour outside of Boston at the moment. Um, literally, the moment I, I, I log off this live stream today, I'm going to get in the car uh, with my daughter, and we're going to head to Sudbury, Massachusetts, and we're going to go be visiting Goodnow Farms. So officially, Goodnow Farms is going to be the first stop on the cross-country craft chocolate odyssey. I've, uh, I've known uh, Tom, Monica, and Tom for some time, but I've never visited their factory. So I'm going to get a chance to see the factory, see the operation, um, get some chocolate bars, do a little bit of tasting, grab some photographs, perhaps do a little video um, today. Then on Monday morning, I'm going to get on the train in Boston. I'm going to um, connect. Uh, I'm going to go to Chicago. I have a long layover in Chicago. And so one of the things that I have done is I've started looking at places that I might visit in Chicago. Now, I have no idea why the Instagram image previews are not showing up here, but I did a little bit of research. So I have a list of craft chocolatiers and chocolate makers to visit in Chicago. This is one list. Um, if you are watching this um, and it's before um, the, the 4th of April, Tuesday, the 4th of April, and you want to recommend a place for me to go in Chicago, please put it in the comments, either here on YouTube, LinkedIn, or Facebook, or on the post on The Chocolate Life. Um, but I, I did the research um, on, on the internet because it's a place that, that I start. I, I know a couple of chocolate makers in Chicago, but I wanted to know if there are any people that I had missed. Um, and, you know, Larry Burdick is a craft chocolatier. Um, I'm always intrigued to know about that. Um, Coco and Company, um, this is a company that comes recommended from a bunch of different sources, especially the hot chocolate. So I'm going to uh, definitely go take a look at Coco and Company while I'm there. Um, a beautiful looking website. They have a big collection of bars. I see Om Nom on the front, on uh, Amadei. Um, some, so it's a nice way to get out of the train station for a couple of hours, um, have a chance to meet with some colleagues in Chicago. Um, I like this provisions for the chocolate life. I'm going to go talk to them about, I'm going to go talk to them about the chocolate life um, while I'm there. And I'm just in a joking kind of way, I'm not going to insert any kind of privilege associated with the name. Um, so I'm really interested in going and visiting them. Um, and then, um, uh, Chocolat Uzma. I don't know that Chocolat Uzma is still open, uh, but if it is, I met the founder of the company doing a chocolate festival in Chicago in 2012 and 2013. So I'm going to go reach out and I'm going to find out if Chocolat Uzma is open. And if they are, I'm going to reach out to them. And I also love the fact, this is Leonid apostrophe S. Leonid is the Belgian company. I don't know. I have never seen an apostrophe in the name. So I'm just curious um, to uh, understand that. I'm not going to go visit them. Terry's Toffee. Uh, I, I met Terry a long time ago. This is not really a chocolate shop. It's a, it's a, it, it's a can, it's a toffee. And chocolate is adjacent to what it is that he's making. But I met Terry, I'm trying to think, you know, well over a decade ago, we've been corresponding um, since then. Good quality product. Um, but I don't know that I'm going to take the time out of my day to go there. I don't know Catherine Ann. But if it's um, if I'm able to get there, I may go and do that. They have a European style sipping chocolate named one of the 15 best in America by Fodor's. So that might be a look. Fud Pot, uh, you know, it's not a place I'm likely to go. And I don't know about Amy's candy bar. We'll figure it out while I'm going. But if you know um, anybody uh, in the Chicago area and you think I should get there then uh, please um, put it in the comments and I will go plan to go. So in addition to Coco and Company, again, definitely going to do this. Um, another recommendation is a place called um, The Plum Market. And The Plum Market is, it, it looks like a gourmet store, but apparently uh, from what I've read, they have a selection of over 100 craft chocolate makers. So I'm going to go and take a look and see what the selection is. And I'm going to be taking photographs and reporting on all of that stuff um, along the way. So I want to do a quick hello to Keith Ayub. Um, Keith, um, you know, is in New York City, um, saying cross-country chocolate odyssey sounds like a dream venture. Um, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a challenge organizing the travel, and I'm going to be there. I'm going to be in 
um, Kansas City over Easter weekend. And as you might imagine, it's been a challenge to schedule things around Easter weekend. And so there, uh, they, you know, there, there are last minute changes that need to be made. And um, that's one of the reasons why I'm having fun using the USA Rail Pass. I can book things on my phone. I can change things on my phone if my, um, if my itinerary changes for any reason. I've got up to 10 segments that I can use any time in 30 days. And so it, it's a really, really easy way um, to go and see the country. And I'm looking forward to it. But also, Good Enough Farms, I mean, they do fabulous work. Uh, you just tried their caramelized onion bar. Well, it's a must. So I'm going to go make sure that I get a caramelized onion bar this afternoon um, when I go and visit um, Good Now Farms. Um, so that's, that's my adventure so far um, in the um, Chicago area. So Chicago is I'm connecting through. I have a long layover, uh, longer than I would like at any point. But fortunately, they have baggage check at the Chicago station, so I can check my bags. And what I'll be able to do is to leave the station and go visit some people. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, I come back and then I'm on the train and the train is to Cincinnati. Um, it arrives at an ungodly hour. It arrives at about four o'clock in the morning. So I'm going to have to figure out, you know, a way to spend some time um, in probably in Union Station in Cincinnati um, and then have breakfast. Now, what I'm going to be doing after breakfast is I'm going to be joined up by um, Paul Picton. And Paul is the founder of Maverick Chocolate. And so I'm going to have the opportunity to spend part of the day with Paul um, at the factory a location and then perhaps at his retail location in the, um, in the Kansas City area. Uh, and I'm also, so I, I want to say a big shout out to Paul and to congratulations. Um, he's got a big event related to becoming a U.S. citizen um, over the course of the weekend. And I know these things can take an extremely long time. So, you know, shout out and, and to that um, event that's happening um, this weekend. It's kept this coming weekend, but we're going to spend some time together. I found a really fabulous little hotel. It's not far from a, a, a nice area of town. It's at the center, close to things, and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I'm also getting a chance one morning to go and visit um, a chocolate, another chocolate maker by the name of Elon. Elon's raw chocolate. Um, a good, they're in Cincinnati, not too far from where it is that I'm staying. And then on Friday, which is the seventh, um, I'm going to be heading up to Columbus. Um, to visit with um, the Denise, who's the founder of Locally, L O H, Locally, good, good, good name, Locally Artisan um, Confections, uh, Locally Artisan Chocolates, see her operation, um, maybe get a chance to see some other things, and then drive back to Cincinnati, where I am going to overnight. The train leaves at about 1 15 in the morning, um, arrives in Chicago uh, the morning of the 8th. I've got a couple of hour layover in Chicago. Um, again, you know, I may, if, if, I, if there are no delays, I may uh, leave the station and go, uh, go and visit some people that I missed when I was there the first time. And then after I leave Chicago, I head towards Kansas City. Um, I Kansas City, I arrive at about 10 o'clock at night on, on Saturday, which is the 8th, which is the evening before Easter Sunday. Um, I found a really nice hotel, not very far from um, Union Station in Kansas City. So I'm going to alight there. And I have Sunday uh, on my own. So fortunately, the, the free tram, which runs around um, uh, Kansas City, is open on that day. So I'm going to go and visit the market, maybe do some walking if the weather is really nice. Get a chance to see Kansas City, um, get some barbecue going on Sunday, if there are some barbecue places open, I think that there are maybe Jack Stacks, I think is a place to go. And then on Monday, one of the places I'm going to go is I'm going to go to the Encore Coffee Company. So Mike, whom I met through the Craft Chocolate Challenge, I was a judge. Uh, the, one of his bars, um, which is a coffee chocolate bar, um, was among the winners. So happy to go see Mike. Um, and, you know, absolutely, Mike, having some way to do barbecue and chocolate bar um, could be really, really interesting. Now, I think that there are a couple of things that I would recommend that you think about doing. Uh, number one way to do it would be to go take your beans to a smokehouse and see if they can smoke the beans like on three different woods. 
So do a pecan, do an apple, and maybe a mesquite, whatever it is that they use in Kansas City. And then take the smoked beans back and use those to make chocolate. And so you have three different bars of chocolate, um, same beans, but smoked on different woods. That could be a really cool thing to do. Um, I would also think about figuring out a way to make a, a chocolate mop sauce um, for people to use on uh, barbecue. That could be a really, really cool way to do um, to, with barbecue and chocolate. And, you know, I'm, I'm reminded there's some really, really interesting bars. I mean, this is not something you'd be able to sell at retail, you know, in, in terms of distribution. But I know the Zotter people had a lamb crackling chocolate bar and a lot of people do bacon in chocolate. And so, you know, getting sort of like burnt ends. Ooh, that sounds good. Could I do burnt ends in a chocolate? That could be really, really cool as well. So I, there are lots of ways to experiment. Um, and we can talk about that when I see you. Um, I'm going to see you on Monday. Um, that's going to be the 10th of April um, in the afternoon. Now, um, one of the wonderful, like small coincidences in my life is that um, I got a call from somebody, this is a long time ago, maybe 15 years ago or more, um, by Christopher Elbow. Um, at the time, I believe he was the chief chocolatier at the American Harvest Restaurant um, in, um, in Kansas City. You know, this is, we're talking about Kansas City, not, um, not Cincinnati. So, but anyway, Chris um, was at the American, I believe he was the chief, chief chocolatier at the American Harvest Restaurant, maybe the pastry chef. Um, and had arranged um, a visit to New York City. He was going to leave American Harvest. For people who may know, it's like owned by the Hallmark Card Company. And he came to New York City. We had a chance to meet. Um, and he shared with me some of his chocolates and some of what he was trying to do. Um, and, you know, immediately impressed with not only just the taste quality, but the visual quality of the work that he was producing. And so really happy to be in Kansas City. And so before I go see Mike at Encore Coffee on Monday afternoon, I'm going to be go visiting uh, Chris's uh, workshop um, factory. It turns out not to, to be not very far from where it is that I'm staying. And so get a chance to reconnect with Chris. I haven't seen him since the big chocolate show in New York City, I want to say 2017 or something like that. That sounds about right, 2017. Um, so see what it is that he's up to these days and get a chance to see his operation up close and personal. So really looking forward to that. So I'm going to spend all day on the 10th in Kansas City. And then um, late at night, about 10 o'clock at night, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be getting on a train um, from Kansas City and I'm going to be stopping um, just outside Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, I think the town is Lamy, Lamy, I'm guessing. Um, there could be another pronunciation. I don't know. If you know the pronunciation, let me know. Put it in the comments. Um, I would like to know how to pronounce it properly. Um, but it's an overnight train. I'm going to get into Lamy uh, around noon or one o'clock on the 11th of April. And um, I'm friends of mine. This is a dear friend of mine. I haven't seen in person in, I, I want to say, two decades um, but we have, but we've maintained a connection and all that time. And so I'm going to be spending a couple of days in Santa Fe, New Mexico, visiting with this friend. Now there are, um, there are some chocolate houses in Santa Fe. So one of them, which is Kakawa. Uh, so Kakawa, I believe was originally founded by Mark Shushente, um, but it's focusing again on sort of, um, hot chocolate and more traditional, more authentic, whatever that means. Uh, I've never been there, so this could be an opportunity to go to Kakawa. There are one or two other places in Santa Fe that I'm going to be visiting. Um, and then um, I'm also going to make time to visit the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum. I'm a big fan of her painting. Um, I've loved her, her work since, you know, before I can remember. Um, maybe, if, and again, if the weather is nice, just sit outside and have an opportunity just to relax and enjoy. Now, one of the things, Clay, you know, what are you going to do with all this time on the train, especially overnight? Um, um, I have been working for four years on the second version of Discover Chocolate. And for the first couple of years, I wanted to do an updated version of Discover Chocolate. And I, I kept beating my head against the topic. And I discovered that the world doesn't really need that book 
to be brought up to date. There's no reason to do a second edition of that book. And even though I have the rights to all the text, I don't have the rights to the images, I don't have rights to the illustrations. And so even if I did an updated edition, it wouldn't look anything like the first book. It would need to be completely redesigned and reproduced. And so um, I've decided to rename the book. It's gonna be called Discovering Chocolate. And um, uh, for one reason or another, over the past couple of weeks, I made a breakthrough in terms of you know, how I'm going to put it together. And I'm going to spend a lot of time um, in my seat or in the cafe car um, on the train um, working on the manuscript of the second edition of Discover Chocolate. And so I'm going to have something like 20, 30 hours or more on a train. And so I hope to be making a good deal of progress while it is that I'm on the road. So um, that I'm looking, so while many people don't look for, forward to cross country train rides, um, this is something I'm really looking forward to over the course of um, the next couple of weeks. And I hope to make great progress on it. It's, um, it's been fun revisiting some of the old words that I've been using, but I realized that those old words have also in large part been holding me back from making progress. And I'm looking forward to doing that. But listen, if you, if you know anything about Kansas City, and you think there's some place that I should visit in Kansas City or some place that I'm missing in Cincinnati or Columbus or something that you know that I should do. I'm going to have a couple of days, a couple of full days, uh, like at least all day the 12th and all day the 13th um, in Santa Fe. Um, let me know. I mean, I will definitely go there. I will definitely um, give you a shout out. Um, and I'm going to be posting while I'm on the road. So I'm going to be making, uh, I'm going to be doing posts um, and taking photographs and doing photo blogs and tasting chocolate, buying chocolate and tasting chocolate. I know my friend Robin, who's in Santa Fe, is a big coffee and chocolate fan. So, hey, Mike, uh, make sure you have one of those coffee and chocolate bars and at least a pound of um, some of your best beans because I'm going to pick, I'm going to want to buy them from you when I'm in Kansas City so I can take them and deliver them as gifts to my friends, um, the friends in Santa Fe as so a thank you for hosting me while I'm there. Um, quick little shout out. Um, so chef, um, Jeffrey Gardner, Jeffrey, I'm sorry, Gardner. So he's in the kitchen and this thought came to mind. You moved from California to New York and I've been there like for 40 years. What did you do with all your stuff? Storage, garage sale, are you storage, garage sale, or are you planning to return to New York? Enjoy the trip. So yeah. So, um, I shipped, um, eight boxes of stuff. Um, each box is less than 50 pounds um, and it represents all the clothing and kitchen and some art that you, you I don't know if people remember um, that um, in my office back in my, my apartment in New York City that there were some paintings over my, my shoulder here. Um, I'm, I've, I've shipped those. Um, some of my kitchen gear that I really can't get, I can't do without. Um, I've shipped that to Arizona or it will be shipped shortly to Arizona. Um, anything that my daughter didn't want. So there are a couple of boxes of stuff um, that she has agreed to take. Um, the couple of boxes, she's, uh, uh, they're here in Massachusetts um, or she's left them in storage um, at her mother's place temporarily, um, which is in Westchester County. And then all the rest of the stuff that couldn't fit, surprisingly, not very much. I put into a storage unit that I have in New Rochelle, New York. And it's, I've had that storage unit since um, I got separated, divorced. Um, so I am, I, I am at some point, if I, you know, if I make the commitment to stay in Arizona for a very long period of time, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find myself back in New York City and I'm gonna go through that storage unit and I'm gonna figure out, there's stuff that's been in there for now 10 years that I haven't seen. And so I'm going to go through and make the difficult decision on what it is that I'm going to keep. Um, some heirloom stuff that I think that my daughter might want, some things that my sisters might want. Um, and, but I just didn't make the time, right, it, it, in this move to actually go to the storage unit and take care of everything um, that needed to get taken care of. Uh, perhaps I was just looking for an excuse to make sure that I had to come back um, before I cut the cord or to say, ah, you know, after a year or two in Arizona, maybe New York is in my future again. So I, I haven't 
it's the only very tenuous light anchor to New York City. So, you know, what's there? I mean, um, I have a bunch of boxes of my photography work, both negatives and prints from when I was a student at Rhode Island School of Design. Um, there's a collection of yearbooks from uh, my freshman year in high school um, in the United States, as well as all of my year, all of the yearbooks when I was a student at RISD. Um, so those are in that. Um, I was a prolific collector of science fiction. So large parts of my science fiction collection, I believe, are still in storage. Um, so, and then I, you know, I um, met, I, I went to TED2 in 1990 and met Jane Metcalf and Louis Rossetto, the founders of Wired Magazine. Um, they were still publishing um, a magazine called Electric Word. They still hadn't come up with Wired yet. Um, I connected with them a couple of years later and then uh, around the launch of Wired Magazine. So I have volume one, number one of Wired Magazine uh, in plastic, never cracked the covers. Uh, I went to the launch party for the magazine um, and I have both of their signatures, both Jane and Lucy's signatures on volume one, number one of Wired Magazine. So that's among the things that are in the book uh, are in my storage unit. Uh, you know, I have no idea if there's any value to them other than sentimental value. I, I may email Jane and Lewis and say, hey, do you have volume one, number one um, signed? And if they don't, I just may gift it to them. I don't know that there's actually any value associated with, uh, with it. <clears throat> but then I have the, the complete first three years of the magazine in plastic. Uh, you know, I went to, um, I went to a local magazine store, bought both copies, bought two copies of each issue. Um, and if there was a split cover, West Coast and East, East Coast, I found both covers of the magazine and put one of them in plastic, never opened them. So I have the first full three years of Wired Magazine in plastic. I, again, I have no idea if there's any value. Occasionally I'll go and take a look at eBay and I'll find out if there's anything, but there's been no there's been no clue um, to me that there is actually any value, any collector's market for the magazines. So, you know, it was a, a shot that I took that maybe there would be value. I was like, I was in that place at that time. And I said, wow, right. And um, anyway, um, that, that's, that's, you know, that's it. So I, I'm, I'm afraid that if I go to my storage unit, what I'm going to have to do is, is give myself you know, not just rip everything out and move it um, around, but give myself an opportunity to look through all of the boxes um, at a very detailed granular level in order to figure out what it is that I want. So there's that. And whatever's left over, um, donate, um, decide to ship, um, give away, to, you know, to friends and family um, or, take, or take to the dump. Um, but um, yeah, hopefully I can do it in the summer or in the spring, someplace when it's not freezing cold because the storage unit um, is is pretty cold. So uh, quick cut out, quick out to Evald, Evald Reitberg, who is in Rotterdam. I, I assume you're in Rotterdam today, um, Evald. Um, if people don't know his company, Heinde and Vera, um, you need to get their chocolate. I'm certainly one of my favorite chocolate makers. I've had two episodes, two interviews with them, with them, with uh, Heinde, um, with. Um, Evald and his partner, Jan Willem. I understand uh, Jan Willem got, also got married in the last couple of, maybe last weekend. Um, so congratulations to, uh, please, Evald, please uh, give congratulations to Jan Willem on that, um, on that momentous occasion in his life. Um, spent two months at Columbus, in Columbus at Ohio State University in 1982, right? Uh, remember one of the best Korean restaurants I ever visited not sure if I still have the address. So Evald, I mean, if, if you got the name, I can find the address, um, but I will go take a look um, at Korean restaurants. I'm probably um, gonna have dinner in Columbus and then drive back to Cincinnati um, before I get dropped off at the train station. So if we, I, I, I love Korean food and um, if it's still there, this is what, 31 years later um, on the other side of COVID, but if it's still there, I'm going to be really, really excited to go. And I'm going to be in Columbus on the 7th of April. And so if you find it, you know, you can, you can email it to me. I think we're on WhatsApp um, and you can get it to me that way. So really, really looking forward to it, but it's good to, um, good to hear from you. Um, 
So again, uh, Columbus to Santa Fe. So here's where things are getting complicated is the way to think about it. So um, I had planned to go from Santa Fe to Albuquerque um, and then from Albuquerque, you take a bus to Denver. And um, I was, uh, I was talking with Mark at Blue Struth's Chocolate, Mark and Yuri. Mark is a regular listener here and he's running through um, some health challenge. And because of the nature of the health challenge, he's not going to be able to, um, arrange a trip, arrange a place for me to stay um uh, um because kittredge is quite outside of denver and then we were also going to try to do tasting events and visit people and and, and he was going to be my host there um, but because of this health challenge that's not happening so what i'm trying now to do is i'm trying to engage with a couple of people in the denver area um, to see if I can arrange a couple of visits. So I can take a bus on the 13th of, um, the 13th of April. It leaves at, I want to say, 9.30 in the morning, arrives in Denver at 6 o'clock at night. Um, spend one, so spend all day on the 14th in the Denver area, and then get back on the bus the morning, it's like 11 o'clock, almost 12 o'clock bus on the 15th and head back to Albuquerque. Um, so there are a bunch of craft chocolate makers in the Denver area. I don't know how many of them are actually central to Denver, which would, you know, be, I think, important to me. Um, I know that um, there's a warehouse that Uncommon has um, in the area. I know that uh, Bar and Coco is located in the area. So hopefully I can arrange to do something. But it's a Friday and it's the Friday after Easter. And it's still not a lot of time. Um, to arrange things, but my whole back half of the schedule just like just got um, um, thrown into the air a couple of a couple of days ago, and I'm still working through um, what happens. If not, you know there is some chocolate in Albuquerque. Um, I have to get to Flagstaff um, in order to get to Prescott, Prescott, excuse me, Prescott, Arizona. So I may work on um, um, getting some time in. Prescott, uh, I'm sorry, getting some time in Albuquerque, getting some time in Flagstaff um, and before I head down to um, Prescott, which is where it is that I'm going to be ending up in this portion, um, this, this part of my life, the next chapter of my life. And um, people who uh, have followed me um, may remember um, a company called Cacao Consulting, Christian Tyler and Jessica Ellis. Um, they have um, their business, Cacao Consulting, in Prescott. Uh, in Prescott, they also have a chocolate company. So they have a new product development and um, startup co-manufacturing capability in Prescott. And they've got um, a chocolate company, Orinoco Chocolate. And I am going to be there. I'm going to be involved in the consulting aspect of things. So NBD, NPD, co-manufacturing, those things. Uh, we're going to be looking at bringing equipment in and selling equipment. Uh, and then we're opening up a recreational school and a professional school um, in, in Prescott. Uh, many, many years ago, I bought the domain name thechocolateacademy.com, believe it or not. And so we've got the Chocolate Academy, um, the Chocolate Academy. We may add some other words around it so because it's a phrase that uh, Barry Calabout uses to describe their schools. Um, and um, one of the first professional classes we're going to be offering is going to be um, towards the end of summer. Uh, so we're scheduling that far out. But um, we're going to be offering what I think is a first for um, craft chocolate makers and small chocolatiers is um, how to operate a one-shot depositing machine. So how to get the most out of a one-shot depositing machine. I know that, for example, depositing bars is a real challenge for a lot of chocolate makers um, in terms of dosing and other kinds of things um, that can be done on a one-shot machine um, but you can also then have the capability capability of doing lots of other kinds of work um, in the one shot whether you're doing a piece which is filled with caramel or a piece which is filled with ganache or all kinds of creative opportunities in terms of using a one-shot machine not just depositing bars and so we're going to be offering a three-day class so friday saturday sunday um, in a production situation so in a working chocolate factory there's going to be, so you'll be surrounded by uh, machines which are used to make um, 
um, chocolate from cocoa beans. We'll be working with chocolate that is made, but we'll be teaching people how to use a one-shot creatively and to get the most out of it. And then also to look at the economics of it. So wow, at what point does it make sense to invest in a small one-shot? And as a part of that, we're going and looking for less expensive but fully capable one-shot machines that what we can do is we can offer um, training and customer support. on. So that's part of what it is that I'm doing. Recreational classes are going to be um, in chocolate making from the bean, chocolate appreciation, and things like that. And then down the road, we're going to be doing more professional classes. But I think rather than you know saying just how to make cocoa, how to make chocolate, although we may we may do that, um, we're going to be focusing on um, taking advantage of the fact that we're in a working chocolate factory, and we're going to be um, be able to you know do large scale roasters, large scale crackers and winnowers. Um, at, we're, there's there's other machinery that we're looking at getting in and then be able to say, for example, you know, you're looking at, um, you're you know, looking at getting a ball mill. What does it mean to work, go from a melanger to a ball mill? So that would maybe the class, uh, a class that we're doing just those things, um, not necessarily manufacturer specific, but just around the, if you want to go into a ball mill and scale production, this is how you might do it. So those sorts of things. Um, that's, 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 that's our goal. Um, so that's, um, those are uh, some of the things that I'm going to be doing um, when I'm in Prescott. And I'm going to be continuing doing these live streams on a twice weekly basis. I'm going to be uh, continuing um, my work uh, in uh, producing countries, you know, with a, a greater focus perhaps on South America than in Europe. Um, and chocolate makers there. Although I've got some really exciting new connections that I've made, can't talk about yet. Um, but when they come, when they happen, I'm going to let everybody know about it. Uh, one of which right, could result in a really fun trip um, later this year. Uh, so um, teasing that for you, uh, but we'll figure out how that, all that happens. And what I want to say really quickly is we're a little more than halfway through today's uh, episode. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining me so far uh, to say you're watching The Chocolate Life Live. Um, and today's topic is the Cross Country Craft Chocolate Odyssey Update. So this is where it is that I've done. So I'm here in Massachusetts. Um, shortly after I close down the live stream, I'm headed west to Sudbury, Massachusetts. Going to spend some time um, at Goodnow Farms with Monica and Tom. Caramelized onions, I'm definitely Keith. I'm going to get that. And I will do a shout out. I mean, I, in the comments or something like that, have a chance to try that uh, caramelized onion bar. I will definitely let people know what it is that I think of it um, and see about a couple of other limited edition bars. I mean, you know, they do great work and, and, and I like them as people as well. What is they're trying to do? So it's always a pleasure to go and do that. So from Boston on Monday, get on a train about one o'clock in the afternoon. Um, head towards Chicago. It's an overnight trip. Arrive early in the morning. I've got a seven-hour layover in Chicago, so I'm going to check my bags and 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 explore the city. A couple places I'm going to go. Go back to the station. Head to Cincinnati. Uh, spend a couple of days in Cincinnati. One day in Columbus with uh, Paul Picton um, at Maverick Chocolate as my host. Going to visit Elon's. Um, raw chocolate. Going to visit um, locally chocolate. Um, I am going to get some Skyline chili. Um, I'm going to go all the way. I'm going to go all the way with the Skyline chili. Um, so spaghetti, the chili, onions, cheese, right? Um, because if you're going to go to Cincinnati, you need to get that. And Grater's ice cream. So Grater's blackberry, no, black raspberry chocolate chunk. And another connect. I may have mentioned that my last cross-country trip was um, from Portland, Oregon to Cincinnati by bus. Um, and I was there for a radio conference. I worked for the for KBOO FM in Portland, Oregon for three years. And, uh, right Between my freshman and sophomore years in college, I took a three-year gap year. And there was an annual conference in Cincinnati. And I, was, I, I, was, I said, I'll spend four days on a bus in order to get to Cincinnati and go there. Um, and we had the great opportunity. Um, this, the group of us who were there, just, it's a great community, a lot of fun, a lot of people, um, to go to visit Skyline for the very first time in my life and then to have some greater ice cream. And I've only been back to Cincinnati once in all that time. 
Um, I was there for an RCA, so Retail Confectioners International RCI conference, I want to say 2014 or something like that, um, and I had a chance to get Skyline Chili while I was there um, and Grater's Ice Cream. So I'm looking forward to revisiting um, and reliving that experience while I'm there. So from Cincinnati, um, and Avald, if you remember the name of this Korean restaurant, I'm going to go get Korean when I'm in Columbus. I'm going to get it for dinner. So from Cincinnati, I connect through to Chicago to Kansas City. I'm going to spend some time with Christopher Elbow and spend some time with Mike King at Encore Coffee. Um, we're going to talk about barbecue and chocolate. We're going to get some barbecue, um, Mike. So I'm looking forward to that. And then uh, I take a train, uh, an overnight train to Santa Fe, New Mexico. And at that point, all that, I got tickets, all that stuff taken care of. I'm not going to worry about any of that. And then I need to find out in the next couple of days whether anything's going to happen in Denver. Um, so I will, I will update from the road. I don't necessarily know that I will do um, an Odyssey update live stream. But if obviously if I'm on a train, I can't do this. Um, so I'm going to, the schedule is going to be erratic for the next couple of weeks um, as I make my way across country. But even if you're not here on the Chocolate Life Live, there will be updates on the Chocolate Live um, along the way. So photographs, video, um, as well as um, tastings um, and of chocolate and food along the way. So I'm, I'm really looking forward um, to be able to do that. Um, and then when I hit Prescott, not certain exactly when that's going to be, I will pick up the schedule for the, um, the Chocolate Life Live on a regular basis for when I get there. And that's the update for the, um, for the craft chocolate, um, uh, the cross-country chef. Craft Chocolate Odyssey. Now, I, there, at the end of the title for this live stream, there's this little imas on more. And so I have a bunch of other things that I wanted to, a bunch of news-related things um, that I wanted to share. And so um, the news-related things that I want to share, the first one is um, just point out. Some of you may know that um, in 2005, uh, Scharfenberger Chocolate Maker was sold to the artist and confections division of the Hershey company. And several years ago, uh, it was during COVID, um, uh, a number of people, including John Scharfenberger on the board of directors, uh, took the company back and took it private. And there was an announcement recently that I saw um, about new packaging. So this showed up in a feed about packaging, one of the things that I follow. And so here's the new packaging that you'll find at Scharfenberger. I think one of the things that many of us tend to forget, so these are four new flavors. Um, I'm going to go and just take a look at the overview of the bars. So one of the things that people tend to forget about um, Scharfenberger when they opened their doors in 1997 is that they did no single origin chocolates. So John Scharfenberger, um, I believe his background is as a champagne blender. If I recall correctly, it was a Vauvricot. Um, he went from France and came to the Napa Valley and opened Scharfenberger Wine Cellars. Um, and he kept that traditional blending background um, into the sparkling wines, California sparkling wines that he made. When he sold Scharfenberger Wine Cellars and then opened Scharfenberger Chocolate Maker, um, he kept that approach, blending. And it was a really, really important thing that he did, he, he thought, to blend. And for the first several years, I want to say for at least the first three years, um, that I'm aware of, they offered no single origin chocolates. Everything was a blend. And I'm looking at what they're doing now. And there is not one single origin chocolate that is advertised. So I think this is very, very interesting. They're saying very, very true um, to their roots. But if you're a craft chocolate maker and you think that you need to do single origins, you don't. And I just wanted to show this. This is a, um, it's some interesting things. So one of the things that craft chocolate makers can do is they can promote the origin. And if you were here for the last live stream, you will know, you will remember that one of the bits of research that I shared was that when the origin of the producing country is listed on the front of the bar, consumers have a better feeling um, about the quality of the chocolate in the bar. So there's something about putting the country of origin on the bar, which leads to a perception of higher quality. None of that is here, right? So, and that makes sense. These are big inclusion bars. But there's also another bit of research that said, like 
you know, 90 plus percent of chocolate eaters um, in the United States like inclusions. And so they have leaned very, very heavily into inclusions, but also very importantly, really, really out there on the front of these things are the percentage of cacao, right? Um, ethically and sustainably sourced. I mean, it's very simple. It's straightforward. It's recognizable. The way that the information is presented on each bar is consistent. So when you when you're to do a planogram of it or you're to merchandise things, things side by side on a shelf, it would be very easy to see um, these are and then go, oh, here's a color and I like that color. This is the color, <clears throat> excuse me, that I want to go and buy. So uh, again, because they're not doing single origin chocolates, maybe it doesn't make sense to put the origin of the chocolate on the front of the bar. I don't believe it's it's on the back and I didn't see it on the website, I, but I didn't spend enough time to understand where they're sourcing from. Um, so it's certainly a conversation I would love to have with John or um, um, other people, or Ray Major, people I know who are at the company. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if I can schedule um, an interview with some people at Sharford Burr um, when I get to Arizona. But I thought that this was um, really um, just quite a nice approach to the packaging. And so I wanted to share it um, with you. Um, another thing that I wanted to share is, and I will put the link to this post um, on, the, on the page for today's live stream, is um, this is um, an article. Um, the IFT is the International Association of Food Technologists, um, as I recall, and I was uh, contacted by this woman by the name of um, Carolyn Shearhorn, who is the author of this, um, to talk about um, artisan chocolate. Oh, here's where I got the Scharfenberger picture. This is where I learned about, this is where I saw this. Um, and it was really, really nice. Um, I'm quoted in it, I'm the first quote, which is always really nice. But in the process of talking to Carolyn, I was able to bring up a number of other companies. So Goodnow Farms is mentioned here. I believe that I introduced um, Goodnow Farms to Carolyn um, during the course of a conversation. Um, the Orinoco Chocolate Company, which is where I'm going um, in Arizona. Um, so also we've got uh, Manoa Chocolate in Hawaii and uh, Brian Graham at Fruition Chocolate Works. So just a really, really nice collection of single origins uh, of, of makers and actually a quite considered article from a food technology perspective um, about what, what is this going on. So I'm going to go share that with you um, on the page for the, today's post um, after we get done. It may not be until after I get back from Good Enough Farms, but I will, I will make sure that I do uh, promote that today when we get done. Um, another thing that um, people may have seen in the last week or so um, is that there was a big fire and explosion at um, a candy company um, in Philadelphia called R.M. Palmer. Um, I'm not certain that they've discovered exactly what the cause was, um, but it turns out, doing some research on who uh, Palmer was, that um, I learned that they have quite a history. Um, they've been around for now, what, 80 years or so? Um, and uh, they're a candy company for the most part. I mean, they're not making certainly high-end confections, um, but... Um, Fortunately, uh, I don't think anyone is hurt in the explosion. It may have been a gas explosion. Somebody suggested it might be a cocoa powder explosion. I, I haven't heard the answer to that question. But um, uh, it was in the process of you know, trying to find answers to these questions. I had never heard of the RM Palmer company before. Um, and so uh, I went and looked at some of their history. Um, and, uh, and one of the reasons why this is important or interesting to me right now is I took a look over at the page view stats for the month of March over uh, for the chocolate life. And it turns out that still one of the most visited pages on the chocolate life is from one of the episodes that I did with Michael Iskonis on the history of chocolate in New York City. I mean, this one episode, and it's not the first one, but this one episode has like been in the top three to top five um, episodes uh, or pages, page visits on the chocolate life um, for almost two years now. Um, which is really quite remarkable. Uh, and so making these connections to older chocolate makers um, has been a real fun. And I've been, it's been an, um, uh, interesting to learn more about this company. You know, didn't know, as I said, I didn't know anything about its history. Um, and to learn that um, there is no, that, the, that nobody got hurt. Uh, another bit of news that showed up in the last week is that Hershey is looking to remove lead cadmium from chocolate. 
an executive says, this was CNBC. So this is a business report thing that's being done probably to reassure investors and shareholders. Um, what I will do is I will also post this link onto the page for today. But if you read it, it says nothing. There's, you know, Hershey is evaluating if it can remove more of the metals through additional cleaning. It's like, okay, we're committed to doing it better and we'll do what it is we can, but there's no commitment to anything here in terms of sourcing. So it was just a blah, blah, blah. Uh, I think it is a blah, blah, blah puff piece, but I'll put the link uh, into the page and you can let me know what it is that you think. Um, interesting um, announcement um, that Fair Trade International has um, raised the fair trade price for coffee recently. Um, I haven't seen an, a parallel announcement that they're raising the fair trade price for um, cocoa. Now, I am not a big fan of fair trade, as I have said. I think it's um, a form of um, socially acceptable economic imperialism, but um, it will be interesting to see if the, the floor prices for um, for cocoa are also raised um, in addition to the coffee prices. Uh, and the last thing I want to talk about today, just give a couple of minutes to, is um, one of the great things I love about the chocolate life of what I do, um, being a member of the press and you know talking about things, is that people send me chocolate. They say, hey, Clay, we'd like to send you chocolate to review. Um, so there was a recent review uh, from the Milk Boy people. Um, and this Alpine milk um, and with lemon and ginger is a surprisingly good chocolate. This is a classic Swiss milk chocolate. Uh, but if you're interested in a milk chocolate with inclusions, you've got a family friend who likes Swiss milk chocolate. It's classically Swiss, right? But it's looking for something different from what you might get from um, the, uh, the Big Boy Pants companies, you know, Lint and Ghirardelli. Um, which is owned by Lint, even though Ghirardelli is not a Swiss company. Um, <clears throat> this particular chocolate, the Alpine milk um, with lemon and ginger, just, it's, it's, a, it's sweet. It's very sweet. But the texture of the ginger um, makes it sort of like a little bit crispy, crunchy. Um, and then um, the lemon is very, very delicate and it's really, really nice put together. Um, and then I also did a review on Ross chocolates, which is... Um, mostly sweetened erythritol. So it's no added sugar. So for people who are diabetics or want to do, you know, keto, keto diets. So this is, I love doing this. People send me chocolate to review. It's great. And some, usually they ask me before it just shows up. And so I got a, 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 a connection on LinkedIn, um, a message from somebody I had known who used to work for Albert Easter Imports. Um, I, you know, I've known him for like, you know, this is almost 20 years now, I think. Um, and um, he told me about a new company in Switzerland. And the company in Switzerland is, um, let me do this. Let me go big. You don't need to see that. Uh, the new company is called Oro de Cacao. Right? And um, it is made in Switzerland, but it is a, an entirely new process. So what they're doing, as near as I can tell, what they're using is something like... Um, the Swiss water decaffeination process. So they're doing a cold extraction of the cacao, uh, which I believe is roasted. But then what they do is they separate the, the cacao into four constituent components. Um, one of the constituent components is the nonfat solids. Another constituent component is the fat. Then they also extract the polyphenols. And then there's a chocolate aroma compound, a component to it. So they deconstruct the chocolate into those four components um, and reconstruct it. And because of the nature of the low temperature, very gentle process, uh, they claim to produce chocolates which are of extremely low bitterness. Now these arrived yesterday. I mean, I had them shipped to me where I was gonna be um, here in Massachusetts. Um, I, 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 opened up one of the 82%. So this is the 82%, um, what it looks like, um, from Ghana. Um, so it's kosher, it's halal, it's vegan, um, um, organic, fair trade certified, um, 82%. And it was too cold at the time. It was just 
Uh, open it up. Let me open it right away. So it's too cold to actually evaluate properly. It's just too crunchy, and the melt was too slow. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do an evaluation of it later. Um, but it was um, interesting in the sense that um, all of the the obvious defects that we might think of from a chocolate, which would be if we're thinking, you know commodity West African cocoa beans um, are going to be, um, there's often some uh, bitterness from over roasting. There is going to be maybe some residual acidity associated with it. Um, all of those things were gone from the process. Now, I couldn't tell, excuse me, because it was cold, which is what the flavor was actually like. Um, so I'm going to go back to it again. But it was it was, I'm going to say, there wasn't a whole lot of nuance in it. So it was a very, very straightforward flavor. But this 82%, um, let's get it in focus. This 82% um, did not eat like an 82%. It ate like something which was much lower in terms of cocoa percentage, while not having the associated sweetness of something which was much lower in cocoa content. And I think that's one of the things they're going for. How do we take a high cocoa content um, product, we reduce the amount of sugar that we're putting into it, um, and yet not having something which is excessively bitter um, as a result of doing so. Um, and again, I think the, the well, it, I, I don't know if it's the beans, I don't know if it's the process that they're using, but again, it's you know, if you're looking for delicate flavor and nuanced flavor, um, I need to go and spend a little more time with the bar before I get to that. Um, uh, another one that they sent me that I haven't tried yet is a 78% um, single origin Peru. Um, I don't know that it says, it doesn't say on the bar where in Peru that it's from or what genetics that are. It's fair trade, so that sort of limits, right? Um, where um, limits the possible um, sources of it. There aren't huge numbers of fair trade costs um, in Peru. Um, but they did, they sent another one. Um, which uh, I'm going to try for you now uh, because I haven't done it. Um, they were, you know, they, were, they uh, sent me two of each bar, so I'm going to open up this one. So this is a 100% chocolate bar um, in the sense that it's 100% cacao. So the sweetener here is made from cacao pulp. So it says that they have dried, it's dry cocoa pulp syrup is the way it's done, um, 20%. Now, I mean, there are a couple of companies that have done this. I believe Ritter has done it in Germany. I know that Felkland tried it and failed. It was atrociously bad. Um, I've had some out of Brazil. Um, and I also had one that uh, Barry Calabas, they have an entire line, um, the whole fruit line. Um, and the Eva Cow line, which came out of the first, the first chocolate from um, Checkout Berry, the Barry Calabas company, the Eva Cow was also just atrocious. Um, and as a couverture, you, you couldn't get it above a certain temperature, which made no sense. So this is 100%. So it, 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 it snaps well. I mean, it's got a crisp snap. You know, I, it doesn't say what the, it does say, it doesn't say what the origin is. I'm going to guess it is. Um, I'm going to guess it is, it is Ghana, but it doesn't say I will find, oh no, no, it, all the cocoa products used originate in Peru, except the dry cocoa pulp syrup, right? So it's Peruvian cocoa beans. Maybe um, they're uh, uh, using the Ghanaian company to get their juice, um, but, and pulp. I mean, I mean, it is an intense aroma as many, many unsweetened um, chocolates are. But one of the things that missing um, from is the obvious acidity, which is associated with most um, cacao pulp sugars. I mean, it is usually just over the top in terms of the acidity and that is missing on the nose here, which is interesting.
So I cut my mic so you wouldn't have to listen to me chew. Um, okay. So if they use the syrup, if they use the syrup, so I don't know if they use the juice, but there's something in it that tells me that there might be some of the pectin in the sugar from the cacao uh, juice um, that has, is having an impact on the texture. Um, it's a little pastier than I would have expected. Now, if you're doing 100% and you've got nothing added to it and the fat in there is cocoa butter and there's no sugar, this is only an 80%. Um, but the difference in texture between this, um, which is at 80% cocoa, and the Ghana at 82% cocoa, the texture is remarkably different. Um, and I'm going to guess it's from the sugar. Um, it's not necessarily unpleasant, um, but it's definitely pasty. Um, what's also true is that um, all of the acidity that I normally associate with um, the chocolates, which are sweetened from um, cacao pulp sweetener, is not there. So, you know, it's, there's no obvious indicator that that's where it is that the sugar is coming from. And so in that respect, I think they've done a good job. I, again, I think the texture is not quite right, but I think that they've done a good job uh, in terms of the flavor. And it's going to be, you know, you know, your decision as to whether it's a particular texture that you're going to like. Um, you know, I can imagine, you know, you know, if you wanted to do, yeah, I, I think there are a lot of applications for this, a lot of uses for it. Um, it's not, it, and again, it's, it's a good example of people who are trying to use um, you know, upcycle the juice and do something with it and turn it into um, a sweetener in chocolate. Um, and it's one of the better, better attempts that I have tasted. Um, it hasn't made me a convert, but it is one of the, um, the, better, the better attempts um, that I have tasted. Um, I'm going to do a full review of all of the bars. There's also white chocolate in there. I'm going to learn a little bit more about the process. Um, I'm going to ask um, the U.S. representatives to come on and talk a little bit about what it is they're doing. Let us know more about whatever the process they can tell us. And so we can get an update on what this is doing. And I'm going to do that again um, for when I get back, for when I land in Arizona. And with that, we're at the end of the hour. I want to thank everybody who started the hour with me and stayed through to the end, everybody who joined me live. For those of you who are going to be watching um, after the fact on YouTube, LinkedIn, or Facebook, um, please, if you add a comment, I will review the comments. I try to respond to them. If you, as in YouTube, um, I tend to get to a little faster than Facebook and LinkedIn, but I do read and review all the comments. And as I, as I, as I let everybody know, I'm going to be updating this post on The Chocolate Life, I'm going to be adding some of the links um, that I mentioned, places that I'm going, places I'm, I'm going to um, be visiting during the tour, as well as the articles about um, the history of R.M. Palmer, um, what Hershey is doing to remove chocolate, the, um, the fair trade um, coffee story, as well as the link to the, um, the food technology article on artisan chocolate. So that'll be added a, a little bit later today. And with that, Thanks, everybody. I am not going to be here this coming Tuesday. I am going to be in Chicago um, during the hour when this is normally scheduled um, between trains. I'm going to be going to be uh, wandering around Chicago, um, gra um, uh, taking a look at some of the sites and visiting some chocolate places. So I will post um, next week um, on Tuesday and Friday and let you know what it is that's going on with me. And with that, everybody, um, remember um, that... Um, if you're working with chocolate and you're not having fun, I think you're doing it wrong. So, ciao everyone.